Great, so for our next panel, how is Washington <laughs> affecting the entrepreneurship ecosystem? Today, we're talking about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is a key component of a vibrant economy, particularly in technology markets. Today on this panel, we will discuss the venture capital industry and trends in new firm formation with leading experts and business leaders. Venture capital in the US reached a record high in 2018, although the number of deals decreased mm -hmm. since its peak in 2015. But VC investment increased even more in Asia. The share of global VC spending in the US decreased from nearly 70% in 2013 to just over 50 in 2018, while Asia's share increased. Additionally, the rate of new firm formation in the US is still not recovered from the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. What happened? How do we compare to other times and countries? Each of our panelists today will spend some time presenting what they see as the state of the ecosystem today. Mm -hmm. First, we have Gil Beta, Managing Director at Comcast Ventures and Founder and Managing Partner at Genicast Ventures. Gil is a seasoned entrepreneur turned venture capitalist, currently investing in blockchain, cybersecurity, IoT, and enterprise IT. Gil has been a founder and operator and works with many founders as an investor today. He understands what it means for founders to launch startups and provide financing for later stage companies. Marianne Feldman is the Henninger Distinguished Professor in the Department of Public Policy at the University of North Carolina and research director at the UNC Kennan Institute of Private Enterprise. Marianne is a foremost expert on innovation, commercialization of academic research, and tech clusters. She's a joint appointment with the National Science Foundation as a program director mm -hmm. of the Science of Science and Innovation Policy Group. We also have Dimitri Serrata, CEO and co-founder of Big ID. Dimitri is currently in the process of scaling his company after raising a $30 million Series B round of venture capital funding after a $14 million Series A before that, with other accolades along the way, such as an award for the most innovative startup at the 2018 RSA Conference um, Innovation Sandbox Contest. For all the talk about GDPR and CCPA in Washington, Dimitri's company is building the tools for companies to keep track of all the data they hold internally. Jamie Suskin is Vice President of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at the Consumer Technology Association. At CTA, Jamie focuses on advocating for policies that encourage the development of consumer technology innovations, such as drones, AR, VR, Internet of Things, and self-driving vehicles. She just joined CTA after serving as Chief of Staff and Legal Advisor of Commissioner Brendan Carr, as well as Legal Advisor in the FCC's Wireline Competition Bureau with time as a detailee to the Senate Committee on the Commerce, Science, and Transportation um, Committee under Chairman John Thune and Chief Counsel to Senator Deb Fisher. Thank you all for joining us today. So I thought it'd be nice to hear from each of our speakers um, for a few minutes about what they see as the state of um, the entrepreneurship ecosystem. So let's just go down the line, starting with Gil. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, so for me, regulation is, is all about certainty versus uncertainty. Um, as a uh, former founder and, and CTO of a couple of companies and now moved over to the venture side, um, all of our portfolio companies, and certainly when I was uh, an entrepreneur, we thought about uh, the markets we were going after, we thought about the regulatory environment, and the best case for, for us was always a predictable, stable, certain environment. So whether there was regulation or not regulation, they wanted to be able to build a business, um, convince investors that the landscape was not going to, or that the regulatory landscape was not going to shift underneath them, and that, and that they can build a large business in a particular industry. Um, so, some, so I'll, I'll go through some examples that I saw of uh, how regulation affected uh, certain industries uh, and the startup community. So one, uh, one obviously here is, is uh, the internet. Uh, the, the US government decided to have a more or less laissez-faire attitude to, to the internet. Um, and it blossomed into you know, a major force uh, that I don't need to, to get into. Um, more recently, several years ago, 
Uh, as we looked at funding for starting startup companies, uh, we had the Jobs Act, which allowed for uh, Main Street investors to participate in uh, the, the burgeoning startup community. Uh, then we had a, an interesting play, which was sort of different when we moved into ride sharing, which we actually had regulation um, against ride sharing, uh, but uh, the, the, the ride sharing companies were able to overturn this regulation by providing an amazing service that consumers wanted. And so sort of the consumers decided that, yes, there's regulation here, but we want that, that overturned. Um, so a, 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 an area that has been a discussion here on, on uh, some other panels uh, around blockchain, token-based economies, uh, and all. That's an area where the, the US government has decided not to take a position yet. Um, and that has definitely hindered the evolution of these new business models uh, by not being clear about you know, um, uh, a, a, you know, what is a, an investment instrument versus a store of value versus a utility token. Um, uh, it's left the industry sort of stuck. And, and um, a lot of businesses, uh, uh, blockchain-based businesses, want to do business in the US. But as, a, but as a result of this uncertainty, they're building these businesses outside of the United States. Um, and then a couple more uh, examples here is one is uh, GDPR, which I'm sure uh, Dimitri will, will address. Uh, but this is you know, far-reaching legislation uh, around privacy and data, um, and uh, it has a, a major impact on, on early-stage startup communities, some being able to, to uh, um, absorb the regulation, the requirements, and some not being able to, right? And, and, and thus, those businesses you know, uh, not being able to, to, uh, to, uh, to handle that burden. And then finally, uh, th there's regulation around investment in the US uh, from CFIUS, which is the Committee for Investment in the United States. Um, this is not something new. The, uh, I, I guess the history of this re re legislation dates back to the, the 1950s. Um, it has been updated recently and basically says that there are certain technologies being developed in the United States, certain companies that are strategic to our national interests. And we want to make sure that those companies are not unduly influenced or that technology is, is somehow expatriated um, uh, through the use of foreign investment and, mm -hmm. and, and foreign ownership. And, and we can talk about it a little bit further, but you know, we've had a number of our investments uh, uh, um, confront this issue here of foreign investment in, in areas of artificial intelligence, in quantum computing, and, and other areas. OK. Um, very good. And so um, uh, my work is very geographic and local in orientation. And so really, um, to think about the way I would define an ecosystem, it is going to be um, something where we're looking at the temporal development of that ecosystem and the relationship of entrepreneurs to if different institutions. And um, when we think about um, technology-based ecosystems, entrepreneurs are very important. And I think what's exciting about new work is that we recognize different stages of development and we're looking for new archetypes and models, so moving beyond the traditional Silicon Valley model. And so, um, what we see is that right now there's great attention and a lot of action going on at state and city level. And as we look at tech commercialization, um, Jonathan Gruber and Simon Johnson have a new book called Jumpstarting America. And they identify 102 places where breakthrough science is being developed and technology-based entrepreneurial ecosystems are developing. <laughs> 
you know, I sort of have to tell you, I've been studying this for a long time, and one of the great disappointments to me is that we see some areas benefiting a lot as industries develop in certain locations, but those benefits have not diffused, and now we see um, great prosperity gaps and a lot of dissatisfaction with many policies. States are stepping into this void very actively. Um, while we would like to think that states um, following Louis Brandeis are laboratories of democracy, many times they're acting much more mimetic, more like lemmings of democracy. <laughs> and it's interesting to me that we have never talked more about entrepreneurship but seen less of it. And there are some things I'd like to talk about that I think affect um, the rate of entrepreneurial dynamism. So the first has to do with non-compete agreements. And this is something that states, state policy has really taken very seriously. Now, in 1994, Annalise Saxanian wrote a book called Regional Advantage. And she compared Boston with Silicon Valley. And she said Silicon Valley was doing better because it had an open culture, and that really made the difference. Boston was much more closed. And so that's a con you know, compelling distinction. But we can also see that this is codified in institutions. And so Matt Marks and Lee Fleming have done very interesting work where they say a difference between Massachusetts and California is in non-compete agreements. California doesn't enforce them, and Massachusetts um, does. And so a non-compete agreement is really um, a contract between an employee and employer that restricts the ability of the employment to enter into competition with their employer. And so this is important because part of the story of entrepreneurial ecosystems has to do with the self-seeding and the spawning that occurs within these systems. So we know the average age of an entrepreneur is likely to be about 40 years old. So that means someone has been working in an industry when they get the idea to start a new firm. Well, non-compete agreements limit labor mobility. And so when we think about the story of Silicon Valley and the culture that developed there, it all starts in 1957 when eight engineers left Shockley Semiconductor to form Fairchild. And there are charts of the genealogy, the fair children, if you will. And this is not only a Silicon Valley phenomenon. I observe it in the Research Triangle Park, and others look at the development of these sort of spawning families. Um, it, we see right now that non-competes cover between 20 to 40 percent of American workers. That's a real significant limit on mobilities. And the courts just upheld that Jimmy John's, the sub shop, could not limit the mobility um, of their sub makers, so they were not covered by non-compete agreements. So what do we need to do? Um, more states are adopting these non-compete agreements. There are probably only three states in the country now that where there's no enforcement of non-competes, California, Montana, and South Dakota. Um, interestingly, China um, requires um, that if you have a non-compete agreement, the prior employer is required to compensate the employee during the wa uh, waiting period. India does not allow them at all. So the next sort of bad state policy I'd like to point to are the incentives and bidding wars. And so we saw this with the Amazon um, sort of competition for headquarters too, right? 243 municipalities um, submitted bids to try to capture that huge investment, and it ended up going to places that didn't surprise anybody. Well, incentives to relocating firms are estimated to cost state and local governments about $50 billion annually. And the costest, costliest mega deals are you know, million, a billion dollar subsidy packages that average about half a million dollars per job. So these don't make any economic sense. 
And so um, why does this matter? Well, if you are a state or local government, you are required to balance your budget. So any funding that you give in, in form of incentives has to be taken away from some other category in your budget. And so we don't really know how, this, um, how these decisions are being made, but there is some evidence that municipalities are using policing fees and court fees to augment their local budgets. What can we do about this? So there's not much data on this. Greg Leroy at Good Jobs First is creating a database that provides data. The Pew Charitable Trust has an evidence-based policy-making project that is advocating for evaluations, and states are doing this. And as a result, um, right now, Kansas City has a ceasefire. So it turns out they realized that there were 116 companies that simply moved across the border between Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas. And in order to facilitate that move, those two states paid them half a billion dollars in, in economic incentives. Very, very costly with no real gains in jobs. And so what we see is that you know this is very costly, that some states are coming to some agreement, but this is probably something where Washington can step in and limit the amounts of subsidies. And this is something that the European Union has already adopted. The last thing I'd like to talk about is rural broadband. And I'm gonna tell you, I think that for too long, Economists have been enamored with urban areas, and so urban areas are certainly important, and we realize that half the population now lives in urban areas, but that means that half the population lives in non-urban areas. And so um, we know David Attor has shown that there's no longer an urban wage advantage, and I just um, was an author, co-author on a PNSA, PNAS study that that looked at how artificial intelligence is going to affect employment opportunities. The truth is we really don't know, but we can question whether urban areas are going to lose their advantage and people will seek other locations. There was just a recent FCC report that found that 80% of rural households do not have reliable, affordable, high-speed internet. And also another study finds that there is a correlation um, between housing values, median housing prices, and internet um, accessibility. Now the USDA is going to expand funding, um, and they've just, actually there was an, a USDA um, Agricultural and Rural Prosperity Task Force that said that that uh, rural broadband was now a necessity. It's not an amenity. And they're going to invest $70 million without much specifics. But really, in the scheme of things, that's not enough. Probably what we need is something like the 1930s Rural um, Electrification Act, a Rural Broadband Act, that really would bring more communities online. And why is this important? Well, we're really speaking now to disenchanted voters and to people who feel that they have limited economic opportunities. And that's a very dangerous place to be. Um, also, I want to mention that disproportionately, this affects veterans who come more from the South and from rural areas who return home and have limited opportunities. Broadband access would help them. Thank you. Thanks. So, hi, everyone. Uh, Dimitri Sirota from uh, Big ID. So I'll talk a, a kind of about three things that uh, where, where governments and regulations kind of drive what I'm doing at, at Big ID. One is really about the function of what Big ID does. So it's really the content of what we're building, uh, why we're building it, uh, who we're building it for, and that, that, does, that deals a lot with some of the regulatory kind of environment that's uh, emerging around GDPR, CCPA, things of that sort, everything related to privacy. I'll talk about that. Uh, secondly, is just the operation. So we started the company three years ago. Uh, we're now, I think, about 135 people or so. We've expanded globally. We have people in LATAM and APAC and in um, uh, Europe and Israel. And I'll talk a little bit about the dynamics of that. And then lastly, the personal. So I'm not actually American. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a resident alien from, uh, from Canada. So this is my third <laughs> company. Um, 
uh, the last two started in Canada, and I'll talk a little bit about the dynamics of why why they were in Canada, why I came to the U.S., and the experience kind of um, thereof. So maybe just starting with the content in terms of the function of what we do. So a little bit over three years ago, um, I've been in the security industry a better part of 20 years. Um, after my last company got acquired, I worked in a, another large organization, uh, basically doing corporate development for them. And it became pretty readily uh, evident that there was not enough being done in terms of the protection and privacy of personal information. So clearly a lot of innovation happening in Silicon Valley, a lot happening in Israel, and yet the outcomes in terms of breaches, in terms of things you read about on the commute from Westchester into New York City, which is where I work, um, clearly there's not enough, right? There was just nothing really um, that was truly kind of uh, creating better outcomes. And so after getting my vesting period done, uh, I want to do something new, and I want to create something purpose-built um, for the protection and privacy of personal information. Now, in part of that kind of ideation, we knew about GDPR. We knew about this kind of cloud over the horizon of new regulations that were taking shape that really were intent on helping companies, or at least directing companies, maybe better, better expressed, on managing the data they collect on their customers, on their employees, so that, again, they could be better stewards of that information. And so for us, thinking about what we wanted to build, myself and my co-founder in Tel Aviv, um, the regulation environment was a big factor, not because we built it for the regulation. The main intent was really about security and the protection of personal information, but realizing that if there's a regulation, uh, it'll be a lot easier to sell and to get companies to adopt the technology. And that's something that's been proven previously in the PCI and the Sarbanes-Oxley, a lot of other areas where you have regulations that help spur on um, adoption of certain types of security technologies. So fast forward three years, uh, we went through a series of fundings. Actually, we've, we've raised over 100 million now, so that was a, we've, we've raised uh, more, more money uh, <laughs> recently. Um, but the newer regulations, and I think now there's approximately 135 uh, countries that have adopted some form of privacy legislation. Uh, California, obviously, is, um, uh, has CCPA. There's, I think, 14 other bills uh, in various state, state houses. There's been talk at a federal level about introducing uh, kind of a nationwide harmonized privacy bill. So clearly, that is helping us, because it's forcing companies to rethink how they manage this uh, vital asset, the data they collect on their customers uh, and employees and clients. And that's assisting us. So clearly, that's not just in our kind of rear view, that's kind of right in front of us, right? And we, we know about it and we're trying to kind of think through how we best address it and help companies address it in, in as painless a way as possible. So that's kind of the functional. From an operational standpoint, again, we made a decision very early on that we were gonna be an international company. So even though we were domiciled in the US, from the get-go, we had more staff in Israel than we had in the US. In fact, for the better part of a year, I was the only staff in America, even though I'm not American. Uh, so my co-founder, all of the engineers were in Tel Aviv. I largely worked from my backyard. Uh, that's where we developed the, the initial code base. Uh, even though we're a Delaware company, we always knew we wanted to be an American company. Uh, we just always thought internationally. And even as we kind of uh, jump forward a couple of years, uh, we staffed up in Europe very early on. So we have staff across Europe in Stockholm and Paris and London and, and, and Zurich. We now have staff in Singapore. We have staff in Sao Paulo. And the reason for that is we realize there's a dynamic happening around the world where regulations are being introduced to protect personal information. And we wanted to be there to help not only capitalize for ourselves, but we felt that it was important to build a big brand out of the gate. And that's also helped us with our partners, right? Some big companies like SAP and Microsoft, knowing that we're an international company, uh, attracted them to us. So in that regard, what's important in terms of what happens in Washington is our relationships with these other countries. Obviously, we're staying away a little bit from China because of the, the tension that exists today uh, between uh, the US and that country. And as much as, you know, we're a, we're a I'm a, traditional um, uh, free market kind of guy. And as much as the government builds these kind of interdependencies, these relationships uh, in terms of the free flow of ideas and, and products, it's helpful to us because we really see ourselves as an international company, even though we're only three, three years old. Um, on a personal level, I'll just kind of maybe mention a little bit about 
how I got to New York and, and kind of why, why the choice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is my third company, as I mentioned. Um, my first one was actually in Vancouver, and then we soon established an office in Seattle. My intent was to stay in the U.S. at that point. Uh, that company did not have a good outcome. Uh, and we had to make a decision. And for us, it was a personal decision about relocating back to, the, to Canada to start our second company um, because of healthcare, because of other factors that really made staying in the US impractical as an entrepreneur. If I wanted to build something, obviously, you, you bootstrap a lot. Uh, and so we went back to Canada. And fast forward a few years later, we grew a company to about 200 people. We had lots of US staff. Uh, we exited for a few hundred million dollars. Um, but again, the reason we were there was for that little thing that happened kind of in Seattle. But all along, I wanted to move back to the States. Now, obviously, moving to the States, we had op optionality. We could have moved to Silicon Valley. We had um, acquisition offers from there. Uh, we had one from New York. The choice of New York was largely based on where I wanted to live. I want to start a company with Israel. I also have an Israeli passport. Um, and New York just seemed like a better, better location. When I moved there six years ago, there wasn't a large established base of security companies um, like you have in Silicon Valley and uh, in Israel. But it seemed like a good place to start a company because it had a lot of the other qualities that you look for. Certainly, it had a lot of educated uh, workforce. Um, you had capital. Uh, you had a lot of the professional services that you would need in starting a company. And so all of those were considerations and uh, again, you know, after doing my stint at the company that bought us, um, you know, I think a couple of months later, after a, a quick vacation, uh, we started Big ID, and, and you know, three years later, again, over 100 million raised, and and hopefully doing reasonably well. Well, great. Thanks uh, to TPI for having me today. Um, as Sarah said, I'm very new, so you'll get the benefit of my three weeks of experience at CTA. Um, <laughs> so we have 2,000 plus member companies. I did a count in our member directory the other day, and about 600 of those uh, fall into our startup categories, of which we have five. Um, so our startup members are engaged in kind of every cool tech endeavor you could think of, um, AR, VR, AV, cybersecurity, robotics, um, digital health. If you come to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, which I have to pitch, obviously, um, in January, then you can see all of that. Um, and so to us, while the policies that Washington implements um, affect all of our members, big and small, we see um, at times kind of a bigger impact on our startup and small business members. So there are a few things that we've been following in particular um, that I will talk about today. So for anybody that knows CTA, probably the biggest thing we've been talking about lately are tariffs. Um, and I am not a, a trade expert, I am not our tariffs person, but um, I know enough to tell you that CTA has expressed serious concerns with the tariffs that have been imposed by the administration um, over the last couple of years. And um, since July 2018, tariffs from China or on China have cost the consumer tech industry alone $10 million, including $1 million on 5G-related products. Um, probably most of you in this room know that we're set to have two new rounds of tariffs imposed on Chinese imports, um, most of which actually are going to impact consumer tech products, um, one round in September, and then another round was just recently bumped to mm -hmm. December, so right before the holidays. Um, and you know, for us, the results are tangible and they're real. So we had done a study that showed that the tariffs could increase the, increase the price of smartphones by $70, laptops by $120, and tablets by $50. So for consumers you know, looking to buy gifts for their families, for their kids, for the holidays, that's, that's tangible. Um, you know, we've said that we're sympathetic towards what the administration is trying to do. Nobody is condoning um, China's IP practices by any means. But at the same time, um, we don't prefer to see tariffs imposed as we see them on taxes on American families and American businesses. Um, so we have some serious concerns. We've seen a lot of job loss from the tariffs. Um, the ones that are estimated to take effect or planned to take effect later this year are estimated to um, lose the U.S. an additional two million jobs. And obviously, um, it's hurting American businesses to have China retaliate with tariffs on our businesses. So um, we have concerns. and. Um, our CEO, Gary, has been very vocal about those. Uh, privacy is another one that a lot of folks on the panel have obviously mentioned and we're following closely. Um, you know, our members certainly support clarity in this area. We feel that consumers have a right to know what types of data 
is being collected by businesses, our, many of our member companies, and how that data is shared. But at the same time, we do have concerns that um, a state patchwork, like we're seeing in California, and GDPR type regulations are going to do nothing but hurt innovation and make it harder for startups and small businesses to you know, want to develop and innovate in the United States. So we've been um, advocating for a federal framework. Um, our hope is that Congress will get it done. I guess we will, we will see how that goes in the next few months. But you know, we feel that a federal framework is better than a patchwork. Um, we prefer a framework that, frankly, isn't GDPR, right? It gives folks and it gives our small business members and all members the flexibility to continue to grow and innovate and, frankly, use data in ways that can provide benefits to consumers. For example, um, we've come out and said that um, not all uses of advertising is necessarily bad, right? There's free services that are ad-based and consumers can benefit from those things. So we shouldn't necessarily ban those things wholesale. Um, it may be a case-by-case -case thing that you look at or you wanna see you know, what services provide benefits to consumers and allow businesses to continue to innovate in ways that help consumers. Oh. Um, we do feel strongly that there should be no private right of action. The Federal Trade Commission, who um, I was disappointed the commissioners couldn't make it yesterday and wanted to hear from them, but um, you know, we feel strongly that they know what they're doing in this space. They've been doing this. Their expertise is in this. They've been working in this area for a long time. Um, private rights of action can only you know, hurt investment, uh, create risk for businesses in this space, and certainty brought from an enforcement model at the Federal Trade Commission is basically better for members in our space all around. Um, there's been a lot of talk about connectivity, so I'm not really gonna belabor it. Um, I thought that the panel was interesting yesterday about the number of Gs that's appropriate. Um, CTA has said that we think that 5G is a game changer for the innovations that the members in our space are doing, um, from stuff like AR, VR, to smart cities, to um, digital health. So for us, we're very supportive of the efforts at the FCC and the administration and elsewhere to um, make more spectrum available, especially unlicensed spectrum, because many of our members use unli unlicensed spectrum, um, as well as streamlining the infrastructure processes, and we've um, supported that publicly. And finally, I think I would be remiss if I sat on a tech panel and I did not talk about Section 230. So um, <laughs> CTA has always been a supporter of Section 230. Um, we feel that it helps small businesses in particular that may not have the resources to build extensive content filtering and moderation systems. Mm -hmm. um, there's some data that indicates that Section 230 has actually resulted in two to three times more investment in US internet platforms than those in the EU. So um, I will actually admit that um, when I worked in the Senate, I was sort of a 230 skeptic, but I had not learned all of that information. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can see how that's very helpful to small businesses and startups in the US. And I thought the conversation was very interesting yesterday about accountability, but for CTA's part, Section 230 is um, a very essential protection for the folks that are innovating in the US um, in the tech space. So I think that's it for me. Okay. Great, thank you. So I thought um, I'll just walk us through some topics and then we can address questions. But first on privacy, um, yesterday and today we've been talking about the value of data, um, differences between user data, usage data. And one um, question for privacy legislation is how to measure data, in, data injury, harms from privacy. So I thought I'd ask Dimitri about how his company treats data um, and if you measure personal information um, with different levels of value and risk. Uh, so so we, met, we treat data like diamonds. Um, we believe that data, uh, especially personal data, is immeasurably valuable. It's an asset that, frankly, <laughs> most companies don't have um, very good safeguards for or very good inventory of. Uh, partly because it's ephemeral, it's stored in very many places, it's collected in very many different ways across different digital channels. Uh, it's not easy, they haven't really had to contend with, but I think as we've all seen over the last kind of decade, as more business has shifted online, as more communication and, and social has shifted online, that data really is probably the most vital asset uh, for American business. 
Um, now, in terms of the value, I think historically people try to ascribe value based on the cost in the event of a breach. So I think you've probably all seen dollar values like $200 per, per identity in the event of a breach. And certainly that's a, that's a way to speak about injury in terms of um, you know, whether it's a settlement or, or some other type of thing. But we look at data kind of more broadly. And I think if you think about it in terms of, um, I think there was an earlier speaker that talked about kind of data as property mm -hmm. that individuals have uh, in the US. I think the Europeans view it almost as a human right, uh, that individuals have a right to their data. And I think that the injury is broader than just some economic dollar value in terms of my credit card getting stolen and me having to go through all the mechanics of, uh, of getting it replaced and so forth. Um, there's re really an increasing, increasing belief among consumers and individuals that data is something that is theirs, just like um, their car is theirs, just like their home is theirs. And when they give it over to a company, there's a certain expectation that that company will be uh, an effective steward, just as if they were to deposit a check at a bank, there's an expectation that the bank would take the appropriate uh, care and accountability around that, that deposit and then provide it back to them upon, upon request. And so I think when we look at data, and when we, and we sell, we don't sell to consumers, we sell to enterprises. What we really kind of promote is this notion that it is truly an important asset. And that asset could be either toxic if you don't really keep mm -hmm. the appropriate records and accountability of how you're using it, or it could be incredibly valuable, not just for you as a business, but for you in terms of your, your um, relationship with your customer and the trust mm -hmm. that you have with your customer. So we take a, a little bit more of a philosophical approach to value uh, above and beyond just a $200 uh, cost to your credit card and social security number. We think that is probably the most important point of relationship that companies have today with their customers. Great, and we were chatting a little bit earlier about your framework for how you think about data intangible assets from an accounting perspective. So could you tell us a little bit more about how, the, how you think about different levels of privacy of data? Sure, and I think this is a reference to the podcast that we yeah, did we were, uh, earlier. We so yeah, um, <laughs> so when you kind of, in the early kind of origin time, when we were kind of thinking through what we wanted to do next as a, as a business and thinking about the, the data protection and privacy problem, um, when in, in kind of, and I'm not a lawyer, I'll just be very, very transparent, mm -hmm. but in my reading of kind of the regulations, both around GDPR and some of the, the talk around it, it felt a lot more like an accounting framework. It felt a lot more, in some regards, as what GAAP was to kind of financial transactions 100 years ago. And when GAAP was introduced, obviously they didn't have software, but it was really intended to provide some, some type of controls over how you recognize revenue that comes in, expenses that go out, so that you'd have a set of standards. Increasingly, that is the ask, I think, for a lot of the regulators, whether that's the 28 member states in Europe or California, AG, uh, that companies truly have a better set of accountability and accounting of the data they collect. And it makes a lot of sense. If you think of data as the new currency of, of the modern enterprise, right? Uh, it really is what drives uh, value in a business. It's the data that you collect. It's how you use the data. Historically, the data has been largely uh, a black box. It's been like the dark matter in the universe. You know, it's 95% of the value of the business, and you don't, you don't know exactly where you put it. You don't know exactly how you're using it. Uh, you don't know if you have the appropriate permissions and consent to share it with a third party. And so to some regard, we look at what we're doing at Big ID as an enablement piece for enterprises to get a handle around how they're collecting their data, how they're storing their data, how they're processing their data, how they're sharing their data. And we look at it almost in the same regard that, yes, we're helping them answer a particular like, you know, data right requirements of CCPA, but more broadly, we're helping organizations to get the same kind of accounting controls that systems like GAP introduced 100 years ago, but for the new currency, the digital currency, the data that companies collect. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So on to another topic. So I wanted to ask about advanced science. Um, perhaps, Gil, you work with um, some companies that are doing leading edge um, innovations like quantum computing. Mm -hmm. So one question that I've had is, what is quantum computing? So okay. if you could tell us a little bit more about some companies you're funding. Sure, absolutely. Um, so we recently invested in a, in a company called Zapata Computing based in Boston mm -hmm. um, that is helping <clears throat> quantum computing uh, 
um, uh, um, in, in, in many industries. So, so just to back up a bit, quantum computing um, is a super interesting from a technical level, and we can go into that, how it, it won't replace existing uh, um, classical computers, but will enhance classical computers. It has capabilities that sort of use nature and uh, subatomic particles uh, to simulate and uh, uh, model things that are impossible with all the computing resources that we have today till the end of time. Um, and so it's really remarkable and it'll help us uh, make advances in many different industries, in oil and gas, in pharmaceutical, materials discovery, in finance. It will have a major impact and be able to solve these really uh, intractable problems that we have in many of these, in the, uh, of these industries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a number of companies that are trying to create quantum computers, so we're, we're still probably three to five years away mm -hmm. from practical quantum computers. But you have you know, IBM and Google, Microsoft, Honeywell, Intel, there are a number of private companies as well that are looking to create these usable quantum computers. What's interesting sort of as it relates to this panel here is that this is sort of the bleeding edge of the bleeding edge. Um, and you know, there are, are uh, definitely you know, world-changing, industry-changing advancements that will happen in many of these industries that I mentioned here. But also there, there's the potential to impact um, uh, cybersecurity and encryption. Uh, maybe not in the near term, but maybe in the 10 year time frame where quantum computers will have an ability to uh, decrypt our current form of, of, of encryption. And um, a lot of folks say, okay, well we have, we have 10 years to worry about this because we don't have a quantum computer today um, uh, that can decrypt all of our, our private communication. Uh, but there are certainly um, entities out there, nation states, what have you, that are you know, storing all of this traffic, internet traffic communication uh, away in some warehouse uh, for mm -hmm. the next 10 years. And then when these computers become available, they will go back and, and decrypt all this communication. So it's definitely something that we have to think about uh, today. Um, and, and this is where the government has an important role in sort of galvanizing, uniting um, uh, American companies to start thinking about what is that next generation of, of encryption? How do we protect our companies? Um, and also, as it relates to certain regulations, as I mentioned before, um, CFIUS, which, which regulates foreign investments in US companies, the US is, is probably um, at the forefront of, of, of quantum research. And, and, and again, it will affect many, you know, many if not all industries over time. Uh, we have a lead in, in this area here, and there are many you know, foreign nations that would love to have some of the capabilities we have here. And well, how do we figure out that right balance where we want investment in these companies, we want these technologies to advance, um, and yet we want our U.S. companies to be protected from you know, foreign entities, foreign companies, whether it's through investment or through other means to you know, extract this technology uh, and all. Um, and the same goes for um, artificial intelligence. You know, as, we, um, uh, as every company is beginning to adopt artificial intelligence, like how do we protect that, uh, um, uh, that, that technology? Great, and so I thought I'd ask just two more questions and then we can move to our Slido question. So mm -hmm. first for Marianne about um, talent clusters and then mm -hmm. Jamie about um, tariffs. <laughs> more about okay. That. Well, actually, no, more about <laughs> connectiv uh, connectivity. Okay, okay. so um, for Marianne, you were talking about the fair children story about right. how talent clusters kind of grow out of apprenticeships. Um, mm -hmm. Is that a different model today than it was before? Like, it seems like um, the 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 entrepreneur uh, the apprenticeship model is a very efficient way of um, 
entrepreneurs teaching other entrepreneurs, you know, right. high impact, productive activity. Right. Um, has that changed between 1950 to today? Well, and so, you know, that is an old historical example, but that phenomenon still exists. And so, um, you know, it is up to, although we have this um, increased diffusion of non-competes across U.S. states, it's incumbent upon companies to decide whether they will actually um, pursue a non-compete agreement. And so many um, enlightened companies don't pursue them. They allow entrepreneurs to go off to start new companies. If they do well, they reabsorb them in. Great. OK. So I mean, I think it's an important dynamic. And my concern is that it not be limited, because I think this kind of, um, if you will, experimentation and this sort of dynamics are important to entrepreneurship. Okay, connectivity, yeah. latency. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sounds good. Yes. <laughs> um, how important is latency for your member companies that are building devices? Oh, and that's an interesting question. Um, so I have not surveyed anyone if I had to guess, right? I mean, I, it's important, right? Because you, you, you know, for example, you have an IoT device, right? You don't want high latency. So um, I think that's part of the reason why for our members, the move to 5G, which was obviously debated heavily yesterday, is important because you know 5G is expected to reduce latency. So for us, that's super important. Um, I think for us, it's also the fact that there's just going to be so much data out there, right? Like, it was debated whether the current 4G system is sufficient for some of the uses that we're seeing. You know, telehealth, right? 4G can accommodate telehealth now, but because of the sheer amount of data you know, that's generated by AI, by the internet of things, by quantum computing, by all, mm -hmm. the, all of the cool things we've been talking about. Um, you need more devices, you need more connections, you need the faster speeds, and you need, you know, the lower latency that we, we believe 5G will provide. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for our members and all of their use cases. And as I said, we could, we could probably debate over whether the current system is um, Sufficient, but you know we are excited for 5G. So, and maybe it's a too much of an uh, uncertain question, but we talk a lot about mm -hmm. bandwidth and uh, and um, speed. But will we be talking about latency you know, more in the next five years? Um, yeah, I mean, so I can only speak from my my prior role at the commission, right? I can't really speak in CTA capacity, but yeah, I mean, certainly it was. It's something that gets talked about, and it's things that get taken, taken into account, like for example, when I was at the commission and I worked on some of the rural broadband initiatives that we did, um, you know, latency was a consideration um, as part of like the scoring for the CAF2 auction. So, you know, those are things that do get talked about and um, people do think about it and different technologies obviously have more latency than others. So, you know, you can be technology neutral, but at the same time, it depends what you want to do. So, yeah, I, I don't, think it's something that could be ignored. Um, you know, I wanted to just offer with quantum computing, which we think is going to be really important to increasing um, capacity, this is an area where the Chinese are making great investments. And they have declared that they want to own the space. Mm -hmm. And in the US, all the most um, the investments in quantum computing are coming from the Department of Defense. And so they have specific applications in mind, but we don't have the same sort of concerted effort to um, really advance this bleeding edge and very important technology. Great. OK, so I guess we can move to Slido questions. Um, how about the first one up there? For Dimitri from Scott <laughs> Walston, having worked in several countries, how would you compare the ease of starting a company in the US relative to other places? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I'm going to take that question in kind of two parts. So first off, just from a regulatory, registering a company, um, making sure you're, you have your employees on the payroll tax and everything else. You know, the U.S., frankly, is a little bit more complicated. There's benefits that you have to deal with. There's health care you have to deal with. You don't have to do that in the majority of other countries. Uh, I wouldn't say it's overwhelming. Uh, usually, you, you have a law firm that helps you out. You have a, an accounting firm. Uh, you mm -hmm. have people that, that help you. But I wouldn't say America is the easiest. But what America has in spades uh, and over abundance is it has a concentration of 
infrastructure that caters to the entrepreneur, right? It has mm -hmm. more capital to build your business than anybody else. You know, I feel sad for all my friends still in Vancouver uh, mm -hmm. relative to the access that I have uh, in the US. And there's no comparison whether it's in Israel or United Kingdom, anywhere else. Um, similarly for other kinds of infrastructures, right? Whether it's attracting talent and all the recruiters, whether it's public relations and the quality of the firms here, because again, a lot of the media outlets are in New York or in California. So from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, there's no comparison. I think uh, having, having worked uh, now and previously in Israel, as well as Canada, and having traveled through a lot of these countries and met some of the entrepreneurs, uh, America has, has, has no second. You know, the business of America really is business. There's, <laughs> there's one other thing, though, I think that's important to also highlight, and I think it's actually an important differentiator. Um, my company is an enterprise company, meaning we sell to enterprises. There is a different mindset uh, among uh, uh, U.S. enterprises relative to Canadian enterprises, uh, English enterprises, Swedish enterprises. Pick, pick your enterprise, pick a country. But America is very different. The mentality here is they want to innovate. They, they think about how they're going to build their career by buying early, by automation, things of that sort. In a lot of Europe, they'll settle for manual. They'll settle for waiting and seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to take necessarily as much risk because there isn't as much worker mobility. So I think where America truly shines is from a buying community. Uh, and that tr that's, that's commercial and federal, right? I think if you look at the early days of companies like Oracle, the US government bought a lot of their technologies. And that really mm -hmm. spurred them on. And I think America. Uh, again, is remarkable in the sense that the people in a lot of these companies truly want to innovate, and that's a big difference with mm -hmm. some of the other countries where I've worked. Great, thank you. So with that, I think I'll just wrap up this um, panel, <laughs> and we have C-Band next. Thank you. Great. Thank you.